This week on the Eldritch Lorecast. What is it about live plays in particular that you just love? This is so connected in a way that is different than world building. This Lego D&D adventure. You got hit. Oh, my arm falls off. Uh, my hat comes off. Hasbro is investing $1 billion into AAA games. I want to see words with friends, but D&D. My grandma suddenly knows a bunch of D&D lore. I don't know why. <laughs> Pokemon Coliseum, but D&D monsters. Ooh. Of professional wrestler Athena entering the ring, cosplaying as Karlak. Do you go back and change and then come out again? You do fight then and there. Yeah. <gasps> Women in Innovators of Play initiative. Good job. Yeah, More of that. <laughs> On settings built into rules. Settings built into rules are great and they're terrible. All that and more right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lorecast, the number one tabletop RPG podcast in all the realms. That's right, we're getting ready for our dice picnic beneath the eclipse, ready for it to go dark suddenly getting out our great sword, getting out our behalot, getting out all the things that we need during an eclipse. Everybody cross your fingers that we don't get eaten by the demons. Uh, my name is Ben Byrne. I am joined by Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin, and very special guest Lexi McQueen joining us this week. Lexi, thank you so much for making the time, first of all. Yeah, of um, course. Absolutely. If you have a player who can't make a session of a tabletop RPG in an ongoing campaign context, what do you do with their characters? I feel like I give them three actions <laughs> during the session. They can either take an attack action, only one. <laughs> they can heal people if that's an option, <laughs> or they can hide. <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, Dale Kingsman, what about yourself? This is actually something I talk about in session zero, so it, it changes from campaign to campaign. The most common method of of handling it for me is that um, at the beginning of a campaign, I'll get a player to designate someone else who's like their their official runner. Right. Who like if I'm out, I give them my character sheet and I trust them to run me in combat or whatever. And then I will um, do the like social interaction elements, but keep them to a minimum. So they just don't talk much that day. They're having a quiet day but they're still around for combat. Um, but, there, you know, there have also been times where I've just, you know, found a way for an NPC to pull them out for a special solo mission for that session or, or oh. things like that. But, you know, sometimes, you, sometimes you're deep in the underdark and there's no great excuse for why they're not there. My default method now is they don't participate in combat because I don't like the idea of having an immortal PC with the party, but I also don't Who like the idea immortal? of them. Well, I don't like the idea of like if killing a PC while their, their player watch. isn't there. <laughs> that's okay, on, that's right. on their designated runner. That's fair enough. Fair me. enough. <laughs> you you got to trust in your friends. Um, the method I have relied on is yeah, just assuming that no, they're there. They're just in the background. You know, this session they're just like not not uh, not uh, in front of the camera. They're not getting their close ups this episode, so to speak. Um, I did start kind of doing similar things where I, I, I the uh, first campaign I ran very early on, I came up with some whole subplot about how Faye kept kidnapping party members. And so when they were away for a session, they'd wake up and then they'd be like, where the hell am I? I'm in some sort of like grotto or something. Okay, now I've got to go back and find the party. And that was going to create a whole new story thread. The problem was when the players started exploring that story thread and then somebody wasn't there, I had to come up with another reason why they had, dis you know, it was just going to begin to create like the timeline in Loki, just create like infinite uh, splitting stories that I would have to keep up with to explain why players weren't there. I remember caring about things like that. <laughs> those, those were good days. Uh, yeah, no, we used to come up with stories. Why aren't you there? Write, write a story about what your character was doing, you know, that sort of thing. And then it was make a smaller stat block for your character that someone else can right. play. So you don't have every spell or every action, but you can be there to help and soak up some damage. And now it's just like, oh, Steve's not here. Nah, whatever. Uh, that's we're at the whatever stage and Friday Steve wasn't there and nobody even mentioned his character except how creepy it is because it's a Weschelkind that has a chest full of rats yeah uh, yeah well he's a ranger he's one of the vermin lord rangers yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's he just opens his chest cavity because he's a doll and uh, the rats come out and then they go back in when, when they're done I learned this recently from listening to uh, it was a Show podcast, which is a great podcast if you're like a movie buff and, and want to see how movies are made. And they talked about apparently when they were making Ratatouille, the movie, the rat movie, they struggled for some time to make the rats not disgusting because people were having a visceral, like revolted 
uh, reaction to seeing rats in a kitchen. That's interesting to me. I feel like cartoons figured out how to make rats cute a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Hey, it's a cartoon, right? It's not real. Well, it's, it's like the hair. Right? The, the hair, hair being yeah. well animated yeah. is yeah. probably wretched for a lot of people. <laughs> to a vermin. I was going to say, we no, watched no. him eat strawberries and cheese, and it's like the most delightful scene in the world. And now that I think about it, I'm like, huh, <laughs> they really did make them so cute. Speaking of other podcasts and other forms of entertainment, Lexi, uh, folks might know you from a couple of places because you have been around the live play traps in particular. You had uh, your own live play going on, uh, Strix U. You, you and Dale recently were on Wikipedia D. Um, uh, you've also done live plays with wizards. Uh, looking, at, you did like a, an adventure from Keys from the Golden Vault. Uh, what is it about live plays in particular that you just love doing and that 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 kind of form of storytelling? Ooh, it feels like theater. I'm going to be so real with you. It feels like theater. <laughs> I think that there's a, a magic to uh, at-home games or even like online games that are not televised. That feels like a movie where I'm like clinging to the characters. I get to see them every single week. Something about live play and especially doing a lot of, you do a lot of one-offs, you do a lot of only two, three, four sessions making a show like that you get to one run things yourself and be like a project manager but then two you get to like say hello and goodbye to the characters in such a short amount of time that it feels ephemeral and it feels like i am clinging to those characters and i'm like i love everyone here but we also have to say goodbye at some point (laughs) and putting that limit of like we've got two sessions four eight sessions or whatever to make a story and make it count it makes everyone go like foot on the gas not letting up uh about their characters Mm. about their storylines and it just really energizes me to tell stories the way that we can the comparison to theater you know i've heard a lot as well um and i and i agree with you even just playing in my home game you know there's been times where i feel like i'm tapping into to my theater roots but something that you just said then that hasn't occurred to me is the, the fact that when you do a theater show as a performer you stick with that character for a couple of weeks you know mm-hmm. if not maybe months depending on how long the rehearsal and then the show process is and you do that show kind of repeatedly you know finding all the little parts of the character finding all the little parts of the scene as you kind of bounce off the other characters uh, and the other actors on stage but that's just not the case with a live play because you only ever do any individual scene once right yeah the dice are definitely uh, a catalyst when it comes to it as well where like you said the story literally changes every single time like i can take the same adventure run it for another whole group and i would get different downtime decisions i would have different npcs that are important i would have different times the times that players even will remember would be different just because of their mm. choice yeah i think what doing it live a sh- oh, like yeah. a show in that like sorry this is just me now off the top of my head i'm like i wonder if there's a show in that like yeah. literally just having a short adventure and every episode is a different group going through the same adventure i wonder whether it would pull out the right. same sort of Thing of you know watching video game let's players you watch mm. a bunch of different people play the same game and you're like what clues are they gonna figure out what are they gonna think when this reveal happens blah 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 i wonder whether that would kind of uh, arise in an audience watching that sort of a show watching this oh. like a different group do the same thing every time i think you could also switch it up by having different dms run the same adventure <laughs> for mm. different players and it would still even with the same bones uh, it still would look so different and be so interesting. Over the years, we've tried to figure out ways to help train dungeon masters to run games. And we've talked about this as a teaching tool. Okay, let's see a dungeon master run this game. Let's see a different ma- dungeon master run it for the same group. Let's see a different dungeon master run it for a different group. Uh, just to show new dungeon masters the variety that you can get even with the same content. Uh, so I think it would be fascinating, not just entertainment wise, but you know, instructive for uh, dungeon masters to see how different a game can be. It also would be interesting, you know, what what the control groups are, what you change and what you keep the same. Because when I was professional GMing, I would keep the same adventure and run it for multiple different groups. And what I would find is that as one group, um, you know, there was a village and they've got to get some information on a monster. And one group said, is there a person in this village who might know X specific thing? You know, they're an expert in this field. And I was like, why, yes, there is makeup character behind the screen and then kind of play that character out. But the first group that discovered that character canonized them for every group afterwards. So that character became 
a permanent part of that adventure and I ended up playing that character the same each time as they went through, which was interesting to see how the adventure kind of changed and canonized and became more detailed. I always tell my D&D group they're, they're the unlucky ones because they're always getting the first draft of any adventure that I run, uh, especially if I'm homebrewing it myself. But that's an interesting experiment. Do you give one adventure to multiple different groups with a different GM? Or do you have the same GM, but with different groups running the adventure? Do they keep the same characters each time or do they go through with completely different characters? There's so many like, you know, control points that you could change that that with. It feels like that could be something where, especially if you're running different players or, or the same characters through, just the control of the situation, maybe they find a new door and this affects mm. the out outcome. And then when they play the game later, it's almost like they're speed running it like if possible to speed run a DD game except you get to halt them in their tracks with something that they don't know every time i had a friend that i played in one of his like long-standing DD games and i had such a fun time and his world was so deeply rooted and grounded and i always i asked him like what did you do <laughs> like how did you this is so connected in a way that is different than world building and it's different than like sandbox like i've already built everything just go hang out with it and over the course of like two years he ran like 10 or 11 groups through one section of his world and let them all go wherever they wanted to go and did right. the same exact thing of ca canonizing how the world moved and he did the whole like timeline thing where he kept a timeline of each group so he could tell what villain are they facing at the same time that you guys are technically facing and whatever. And I was like, this is nuts. I felt like I was seeing Sherlock's brain. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of sort of, you know, canonizing and then let us segue into writing because writing, I mean, you do so much, Lexi. You're, uh, looking at your resume, it, it, it feels Lexi, very I relatable. Lexi, resume? <laughs> no, not literally, but figuratively. online. Online places where, where I have found Lexi. That's how be. you get a guest spot on this show. You send, yeah. in, the <laughs> send in a resume and, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll conduct interviews live on air. Uh, no, it was just so relatable because, there's, you know, similarly, and I, I'm sure that, that, you know, Dale, James and Sean probably have done the same thing at different times. It's just like I, I tried acting for a little while, but I'm not an actor. I've done a bit of writing, but I don't think I would have enough credits to consider myself a writer. I've done podcasting for years now, but like, am I a, po you know, th there's less like, it's more just creative artist, you mm -hmm. know, who does lots of little bits of little things as opportunities kind of present themselves and arise. Is that how you, you, or pardon me, let me formulate a question. Is that how you feel you've progressed or like just grabbing opportunities as they've arisen or have this you been more so targeted and intentional <laughs> yeah it is it is millennial <laughs> existentialism you're right I'm just, what am i what what have i given to the world what have i produced <laughs> yeah i mean i think it is i think it does culminate to just creativity wherever i can find the outlet for it um i've been thinking a lot about art recently and like people who make who, who do things because they think that it's right or do things because they think that it's fun and the difference between those kinds of people or do things because it will make you money or whatever and the outputs are different and i think i'm always trying to lead with what is the most fun and also what helps the most like i do a lot of shows for free specifically because i'm just like i want to help people out i want people if someone needs a fourth person for a game and it's not going to happen unless a fourth person sits down, I will sit down at that game and make it happen. But I'm always leading with like, what's the most creative because I've never been comfortable taking on just one label of like, oh, I just write or I'm just like you said, acting or performing. I'm just a musician. I'm just this, this and that because then I get a little grass is greener. <laughs> I go, oh, but the, the artists have so much fun. I wish I could be like them. And I hate the pressure of being like, well, you have to be good to be like them. I hate that pressure. So I'm just like, I'll try it. I'll just try it all. I feel like we've got an on-running campaign here, which is this Lego D&D adventure, uh, a Lego set, this D&D Lego set. We can't stop talking about it. We've been following this we've since- We've been tracking this Lego set for a long time. For like time. a year and a half now uh, since uh, that competition first ran. But the adventure is now available for that Lego set on D&D Beyond. You don't need the Lego set to go access that adventure um, it is a level five adventure, um, uses every part of the D&D Lego set, if you have the set, to be able to, to run it using that set. Uh, four 
fifth level pregens included. Each has a minifigure that comes in the uh, Lego set and also uh, encourages, which I think is is kind of clever and kind of fun, the group to kind of build elements of the Lego set together. You know, as you move into the next area, then you literally build the next area of the adventure together. Um, and there are game interactive elements such as the sort of sharpness can be used to like cut off pieces of the Lego set. Uh, which is kind of fun that you can literally break away. But probably, uh, possibly, the the most interesting part of this is that, uh, first of all, it's a PDF, which D&D Beyond never does. And secondly, there is a one page of rules to run the Lego set adventure kind of not in 5e. Is it even 5e light at this point? Is it even 5e adjacent or is it just a different game? uh, It's a whole different game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I uh, I read this last week, uh, so I I don't remember too much, but I do remember this one page rule set. Seemed like something that you would do as a kid playing with Legos, like oh we're going to do this and roll dice and oh you got hit oh my arm falls off <laughs> or oh uh, my hat comes off and that seems so cool. That is a way for people who who don't play D and D but love Legos, or people who play D and D and love Legos, to sort of get on the same page. And it's not in the the D and D adventure isn't a teach people to play. This is a you sort of need to know the rules to use this, which mm-hmm. I think is fine because that one page thing is there for people who just want to play a D and D like game that has nothing to do with five E D and D rules. Yeah, it was interesting looking at the character sheets. I I was surprised it was fifth level because I assumed it would be like an introductory to to D&D. I thought it was going to be like first or second level or something. When I saw it was fifth level, I was like, huh, okay, that's interesting. And then discovered that one page of uh, of kind of free free run rules. But even the pregens have like the spells on them and they say something like, is it the command spell just says you command a creature to do a simple thing or something like that. And it, you, you can see how you would run it without being the specifics of like, you can tell it to do these three things and it lasts for a round. And if the, if you command it to do this, it'll do that and blah, blah, like very specific of how the command spell is actually laid out. There's like a free form version of all of the spells attached to the character sheets. Let me tell you, could you imagine my relief if that's how spells worked in 5e? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no more, no more looking things up. Oh, oh, that'd be beautiful. Where did it be nice if we Would you prefer the, the rules light version of that though? Like trying to figure out like what's powerful enough for command, but not too powerful <laughs> Look, that it feels broken. I know that eventually I running it <laughs> would have frustrations. But as long as someone else is running it, I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> we, already, we already leave so much up to the DM's discretion. Why not? Mm-hmm. Other Why games not? do it. Why can't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It definitely gives the vibe of like like when I read this, I just imagined a group of kids around a table or standing outside or something playing and there's no bounds because they don't have a map. Like maybe they're carrying the the figurines with them rather than like them sitting down with these character sheets because the way they even read just like, you know, render someone completely silent or create a spectral weapon. Like this sounds like stuff you like you're sitting in your office and you hear kids outside yelling and screaming this stuff. <laughs> Rather than I've being got a like, sword. I've got a sword. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You can't talk. <laughs> well, that's that's funny because that's exactly how I. I think I mentioned this last week or the week before. Whenever we last talked about the Lego set, the way I got introduced to war gaming, it was initially, was literally grabbing the little flat piece of Lego, the little you know whatever we we used to just call them flats, but whatever the flat piece is, using that as a base, putting a minifig on it, much as they do now, just as a product. But then getting different size flats for like horses and then building tanks and putting them on a base and then just lining up, okay, this is the bat army because we've put bat wings on this horse and there's a big dragon in that army. And this side, we're going to use all the like blue and silver looking knight pieces to make a good looking knight army. And we're just going to like hairbrain some basic, like I didn't know how to play war games. I was like eight at this point, but it was like, all right, this guy can move that much. And this is a horse, so it can move a little bit further, not measuring at all, just going like, you know, eyeballing it across the carpet and then having them run into each other 
and then just being, all right, he attacks him, so he dies, and picking up a dude and, like, moving him off the table. And then he attacks him, but he's more powerful, so he doesn't die yet, but he's taken a wound and just remembering that that dude's, like, a little bit damaged, you know, not not any specifics around how much damage or whatever. And that, uh, I think you're right, Lexi, this Lego set kind of smacks exactly of that kind of just creative freedom to to kind of, you know, throw things at each other and and uh, get into gaming uh, in a really accessible way. I thought that's how Warhammer worked already, isn't that? <laughs> me too, actually. <laughs> You're telling yeah. me there are rules? That's why they what? kicked me out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the prettier paint job won. Isn't that how? Oh, uh, if only that was it's always true. always how I played. <laughs> Yep. If you want the adventure, you can go get it now. It's on D&D Beyond. Uh, download it as a PDF. So um, Taos will be like, yay. Um, and uh, that's that. Speaking of things that will hopefully make Taos happy. D&D video game news. I have no idea if that will make Taos happy. But D&D video game news. There was kind of a smattering. Look, this isn't really much. Hasbro is investing $1 billion into AAA games. Kind of that $1 billion possibly coming from Hasbro and uh, Wizards kind of combined. Or whether you consider that to just be the same person's money. I'm not really sure. But uh, one report said that Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast are putting a combined $1 billion uh, into video games. We kind of know that Hasbro is trying to reinvent themselves a little bit right now into a, a video game publisher. Um, uh, they've got Atomic Arcade developing a G.I. Joe game focused on Snake Eyes uh, that is apparently inspired by the Batman Arkham games. So if you like Snake Eyes and being a ninja, if you like being Batman but you just couldn't stand the pointy ears, that might be for you. They've got, uh, I didn't actually write it down here, but while I'm just reporting on all of this stuff, it's worth mentioning they've also got Exodus from another company that is uh, a subsidiary of Wizards, which is a new IP. Uh, looks kind of like a sci-fi Mass effect style game. That looks pretty cool. And then just they were being asked about, uh, you know, the future of d and and are we going to see uh, new D&D games not set in the Forgotten Realms? And the answer was yes. Oh, good. Simple. Great. <laughs> good. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which just led me to think, you know, with Larian no longer working on Baldur's Gate 4. Bold and powerful move. Respect. Uh, I thought you were going to make a pun then when you started with the bold. <laughs> um, a Baldur's powerful bold. move. Oh, I should have um, done something. I'll work on it. What D&D video game would you like to see? And what makes it D&D? Because, for example, I'd love to see like a, a game that's not necessarily a, 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 a turn-based RPG, but maybe something closer to a, a God of War or The Witcher set in Dragonlance. I feel like that would make Dragonlance very accessible for me as a setting. What would you like to see? I have bizarrely found myself wanting to see video games that are D&D games that are literally just plucking like popular adventures and making a, a straight run playthrough of those games. But I think partly that's probably because I don't know how many of those I will play at the table <laughs> and it would be nice to experience them in an environment in which I am comfortable. Um, <laughs> but also I always think about... It was it was a D and D game. It was a video game that I played as a kid. I don't know what it. I I genuinely don't know what the game was. But it was it was like a, a build your party. There's four party members, and you go through, and you, there was a dungeon, and we were opening chests and and you know um, rolling dice. I guess I don't I don't remember there being like a visual representation of the rolling of the dice, but maybe there was. Who can say? Um, but it was kind of like I need you to imagine like. RuneScape, but like high quality and couch co-op, four players max, um, during a golden age of Xbox. Um, but no, I would I would just go over to my neighbor Chris's place and we'd sit down and just play it for hours and hours and hours. And I have never been able to track down this game, but to me, that is the gold standard of D&D game. <laughs> and I know it's nostalgia. I know it is. But I and it was it on it was on Xbox, but like OG Xbox, little black I, box I with the X it, on I it. I think it was OG Xbox because okay, I was still a, living in my hometown. That's um, not a huge library. Internet, get on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is this I, game? I want to know. I want to know. If I, I find screenshots and can confirm with my yeah. childhood memories, you win a prize. That prize <laughs> is my admiration. <laughs> Retail should've value two ninety nine. Yeah, should have kept, kept the prize after. a secret. It should have been a mystery prize that I revealed later. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to see words with friends, but D and D. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Use spell Glabrezu. Exactly. 
<laughs> a Sarah rock. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was gonna say it would get it would get kind of nuts. I feel like it'd be very funny to figure out the points system because the more obscure the reference, probably more points there is. And I could just imagine people oh, playing <laughs> like this is like a Facebook game or something like that, and people are playing with their grandma and just absolutely yeah. demolishing. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a great way to bond. Yeah, exactly. Yes. My grandma suddenly you know, knows a bunch of D&D lore. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what mobile games are for, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about, uh, I'd love to see a Spelunky actually set in a dungeon where you're you're going like drilling down through a dungeon and it's a roguelike and it starts very dungeony and then, I don't know, maybe you go down through the nine hells or something. But just seeing like a cute pixelated like Beholder or Imp, maybe it's through the Underdark would be fun uh, and you got to jump on their heads. That'd be really good. Joe Pizza Beats in chat says that there's a D&D Wordle, so I know what I'm Ooh. doing after this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. I feel like there would be such a fun aspect. You know those, like, I don't know if it's an actual game, but sometimes I see these videos where it's like, 10,000 chickens versus like a hundred elephants or something. <laughs> but like you can do different CR uh, like creatures and monsters against each other to just, you know, see how it pans out. I feel like that would be very fun. <gasps> yeah, great. Uh, 10,000 cockatrices against want, a Tyrannosaurus. Like, yeah. <laughs> Pokemon Coliseum, but D&D monsters. Ooh. Ooh. That would be great. I think Pokemon... I'm- monster catcher would be very fun like a pokemon bug snacks where you're going around not pokemon sorry that that's just bug snacks a, a D <laughs> bug snacks where you're going around just taking photos of different D monsters uh in their natural environment so pokemon <laughs> snap but it's bug snack but <laughs> but, but it's, it's D. <laughs> yeah because you can eat all the monsters yeah I, <laughs> there you go i feel like okay. a wild beyond witch light kind of story like fae story I haven't really seen a lot of video games do like true face stories where like transportation is like it's a 50 50 chance you actually go where you want to go and you have these like romances still but they're very dangerous and different monsters and vivid colors and playing around with that kind of stuff. I feel like it could be really fun but I also would be down for just a true story game like following one character and you're just playing through their story. I think, especially because the whole like Feywild, especially with that adventure, they were trying to do that, you know, combat is not always the best option. I think it'd be really fun to see how different people play. And then at the end of the game, it tells you like 10% of people chose that and 50% of people chose this and comparing runs to other people would be fun. The Life is Strange people doing mm. like a, a D&D style adventure could be fun in yeah. that vein. They've just done a new game actually called Banishers, which is uh, you you banish ghosts. You're a witcher, but oops, ghosts only, uh, apparently. I've looked at playing it, but it looks cool. But in the trailer, they use the like the word banish and its derivatives too many times where they're like, we're banishers, we banish ghosts. We banish I'm going banish. to go and do some banishing. I have to just... just f- just very quickly, so Witcher Watch for starters, ye olde yep. Witcher Watch, but also instead of just saying ghost hunters, ghostbusters, any cultural reference that's about someone who specifically interacts with ghosts, a common trope in reality and fiction, you said a Witcher, but only ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I'm sticking to it. But also, to be fair, it's because I was watching a review and that's how the review verbalized it was uh, was witches, but only ghosts. And that's how uh, the Witcher is my touchstone for all monster hunters uh, forever after, as may become relevant in due course. Speaking of uh, 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 characters from fantasy settings, uh, I also just this threw this good. into this the, the news. Great yeah, no, segue. great. Um, it's in the video game, the D&D video game news bit. Uh, I don't know anything about professional wrestling. But I've seen the clip of professional wrestler Athena entering the ring, cosplaying as Karlak, complete with axe, uh, costume, the lighting is all red, uh, she looks like she's walking out of hell, it's pretty, it is like, look. We it is thought probably... we hit the mainstream when we got video games and movies. This is the mainstream. Yep. Yeah. We got Yeah, them. this is yep. mainstream as this podcast gets. Yeah, it, I mean, look, it's a pretty cool 60 seconds of wrestling. Uh, I didn't watch the actual fight, um, but the entrance was cool. Did they wait? So I, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't watch wrestling. I don't know anything about wrestling. So you come out in a costume. Yeah. There's music, hype, hype, hype. <laughs> do you? Do, are you then committed to fight in that costume, or do mm-hmm. you? 
do you go back and change and then come out again? You do fight then and there. Like you walk out, <gasps> you make your demands, you, d- you know, you do the whole thing and then you fight in the whole getup. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Maybe I'll become a wrestling fan because <laughs> that if sounds ludicrous. If you're not careful, you can use the axe too, which is nice. <laughs> oh. Listen. So, uh, uh, wrestling yeah. correspondent uh, Lexi McQueen, uh, how how was the fight? Did you watch the? <laughs> um, I only got to see the start of the fight because I happened to be working. Um, but I do have to say that with a, f- I have like a whole friend group that is dedicated to wrestling. This is all that they were talking about. So I just have to assume it went well. This is like me when I start watching a baseball game and the tide turns against my team and I just stop looking. I'm like, You're I, like yeah. I just assume it went well. <laughs> I'm looking away from the score now, so it has to go great. <laughs> but, well, speaking of things that are going great. Also in the news this week, um, Hasbro is doing a second round of their uh, Women Innovators of Play initiative, which I vaguely remember. I think we talked about this last year when it was first uh, came up. First launched in 2023, uh, women game developers submitting their ideas to Hasbro. Three winners were chosen, uh, which each received uh, $10,000 kind of, uh, I suppose, prize money, or maybe it was a grant style thing, um, uh, plus mentorship from uh, some of the uh, folks in Hasbro. Uh, with one winner from those three, uh, who was Ellie Dix, chosen to uh, have a partnership with Hasbro that would see her game fully developed, marketed, uh, and released by the company, um, which seems cool. I don't know. Uh, that seems cool. Uh, that's a, a cool opportunity. Uh, and in 2024, they're going to do it again. Uh, the submissions will open in October, on October 10th, I believe. Uh, with a separate event. So they're adding another event this year called Girl Innovators of Play, uh, targeting explicitly younger developers aged between 18 and 24 uh, in partnership with another organization called Girl Up, um, which is about sort of seeing women and and young girls, uh, you know, developing professionally. Uh, And also uh, they are going to run a Girl Innovators Boot Camp event in August um, uh, with a follow-up event later in 2024. so if you want to get involved in that, uh, go check out Hasbro's website, I guess. Yeah, I think that sounds great. <laughs> I have no deeper commentary other <laughs> yes. than that's great. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> More of that. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> Just letting folks know once again, Monsters of Drakenheim uh, is still being kickstarted. We're mid-campaign at the moment. Um, if you're looking for a new monster manual, this has got you covered. 150 plus new monsters plus New deadly conditions, layers, so that they're ready to go. Uh, you can just run them, uh, put it straight into your adventure. You don't have to come up with a lair um, for some of the monsters. Um, lore, all that sort of stuff. You know, I'm posting the link now in the chat. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, great. Um, go check out Monsters of Drakenheim. Moving right along into our listener emails, if you have an email, uh, Dale, where should folks send it? Oh, God. Um, uh, podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. You got it. Uh, and the then old, if they... Off. It's just podcast <laughs> at ghostfiregaming.com. Sure if you send correct. it to Oh God, you're going to get a different response. <laughs> mostly. From God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Pope, who actually is in charge. What did I say the Pope is yeah. in charge of? I don't remember. Something to do with the, the ghost fire. He's in charge of the ghost yeah, fire. Yeah, the Pope right. actually is the CEO. Speaking of, of hunting fire. ghosts. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this question, though, not coming from email. Haha, <laughs> trick jar. This coming from Spotify. That's right. You can leave comments on Spotify. Just, just scroll down in your Spotify app. You can leave a comment. Question. Sometimes I remember to take them. This one coming from Dominosh asking, what is your opinion on settings built into rules? and the importance of settings being designed for a rule set. I'm going to flip and kind of go vice versa, uh, rules uh, based for settings. Settings built into rules are great, and they're terrible. It's great if the setting really, really works well with the rules that you're, you've made, and it's terrible if it doesn't. Terrible if it's done poorly, or if you want to divorce the setting from the rules, but you can't because the setting is so ingrained in the rules. I don't want to run this sword and sorcery fantasy. I want to run right superheroes, but I can't because this game is literally only playable with uh, sword and sorcery. So if it's done well, great. If it's done poorly, boo <laughs> is, is uh, 
<laughs> is sort of my, my take on it. Yeah, I so this might surprise some people as I am a very public like mythology fan. I get deep into the guts of like the the details of various worlds I'm a fan of, but I am the ancient enemy of lore. If I open a TTRPG and there's a whole chapter I have to read about the lore of the world, I I want to throw things. Um, it's, it's, I think it's just because I'm kind of a world builder DM, so I like doing that stuff. Um, but I've also found that I really struggle with systems that are completely deliberately devoid of um, genre or, or setting in, in any way. Like if it's, if it's really meant to be a system that is designed to just be applicable to anything and you can, you can put it on anything. I guess it's that, that thing of when it's harder to create something in a void versus if you have some boundaries to work with. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, I struggle, but I do it to myself. Um, because I, I really do like coming to a, a game that is, it is designed with a setting in mind because often I find that that does, um, if, if it's a good game, as Sean says, it comes with kind of attachments of genre and, and there's a lot of sort of concepts that I can build from. But then I painstakingly tear out the lore and the setting that these people have lovingly created for me and I throw it away <laughs> and I figure out my own thing. Uh, and then I start homebrewing so that the bits that don't work without the setting will work without the setting. Uh, I maybe I'm a bad person. Who's to say? <laughs> it's not mutually exclusive there. <laughs> Duality. I feel like I sit in the same pocket as you. I I feel very guided by the genre, by the feel, and what I'm promising someone when I say I will run something for them, or if I say I would like to run a certain game and it has something already tied to it. I think that it's important to promise uh, or t to like promise one thing and actually deliver that but i struggle so much if i have to be the one to like know all of the lore um know the names mm. of people i'm a big like name off the top of the head person i'm a big uh if someone says that kind of what we we're talking about earlier like th is there someone specialized in this i want to be able to come up with it because then that's a stronger tether in my mind than like trying to dig for someone else's idea of like a helpful NPC when I know what the most helpful NPC is going to be based on what my players are asking me. Um, so I found that like if the setting and if the rules are built into the setting or the setting is built into the rules, I end up ripping it apart as well. <laughs> I just, <laughs> it, it just happens. Um, yeah, I think there's a difference too, between setting and genre or setting mm -hmm. and play style. Okay. Um, okay. So, so you can you can make a game that captures a certain play style without getting too deep into the setting. If you want a fast paced game with in, instead of keep keeping track of hit points where you hit, you hit, you miss, you hit, you hit, but things happen very quickly. That's one thing that you can do, but doesn't have to touch on setting. You're touching on play style. And yet I continuously find <laughs> that every time I pick up one of these genre games where it could be devoid of a setting, somehow I still end up reading so much about the setting. Again, lovingly crafted, <laughs> often gorgeous, wonderful worlds, so special and good. But I, there's so many different types of vampire in Vampire the Masquerade, and I just, <laughs> the names just don't stick. It's like Teflon. It's, it just slips right off. Um, and I... I would love it if I, yeah, I, I, I really, I don't know. I just, what do you, I you don't know the to. difference between a, a Bruya and a, and a, 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 I don't know, another one, Nosferatu. Is, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Bruya, I did have some mnemonics. Bruya are like brouhaha. So are they. <laughs> That's what I so think too. <laughs> <laughs> so are they the Atticists? Mm, yes. <laughs> No, Some, someone correct us in chat. All I, my, the only thing I remember is Bria Bruhaha. <laughs> I do remember. So I know. So there's Nosferatu, Nosferatu. which is easy to remember, and, and what their whole deal is. There's <laughs> um, uh, uh, the Ventru, not to be confused with what's the faction called the that other runs one that's the masquerade. Very similar. No, there's the everybody. Everybody has to like play to the masquerade, and there's the faction. 
and the Ventru are the ones that are tied most closely with that faction, and that's where I get confused. Is that faction's know, not a type man. of vampire? This is wild. Um, anyway, there's, there's like there's, there's Bruya, like thirteen. There's, there's there's the 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 ones that are like all romantic, and they're all like oh swoon, and and that's what I played. I remember that, but I can't think of its name right now. See, this is it's, the part where like I think the this is just one. a big prank on me that you're uh-huh. just making <laughs> all of this up. So where this conversation kind of uh, tickles my brain and gets me thinking. Chat says I'm right. Chat says I'm is, right. Um, Bria you could say anything uh, about uh, Vampire the Masquerade and I would say you're right. I just don't know <laughs> anything. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, you you've been a, a big proponent on your channel as well on, on Monarchs Factory. Um, uh, I'm gonna have YouTube, to stand by something I've said about how Five E is, you know, at least in some sense hackable. And you know, oh, you've yeah. been the the one who people come to you and be like, you know, oh, why don't you play this other game instead of, you know, that would be mm. closer to what you're trying to achieve with Five E. Very much. And and Five E is one of those games that interests me because it's broad enough. Technically, you can see the setting in the rule system, right? The way magic works is technically kind of Vancian. Yeah. But it's also not so much that that you can't imagine it working in a different way yet using the same rule system. Um, you know, mythologically working in a different way but using the same rule system. Um, and often uh, what... What comes to me is when people make videos on YouTube and they're very like, 5e is like this, and you can't do it like this because this is also in the rules, you know? Like, there can never be a murder mystery in 5e because um, read mind, read thoughts, detect thoughts, and speak with dead are both spells that exist with the assumption that because they're in the rules, they must be, like, widespread. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which yeah. is semi well- semi true of the Forgotten Realms, maybe, but I just feel like everybody assumes with 5e specifically that uh, the, the, the rules are true and the entirety of the rules hold true for every setting because they must because they are in the rules, if that makes right, sense. Right. I, I think a lot of the people who um, uh, push back against the prolific uh, homebrewers and hackers in the world, they're coming from a place where they're like, why are you fighting to move upstream. Like, why are you, why are you trying to be a salmon um, when you could just play this game, which works and is good and is fun? Like, it, they, they're trying to make things easier for you, but um, I think for a lot of us, this is the way that we enjoy the game is, is by making it not be easy. Like, by making 5e, like, forcing it to be sci-fi or forcing it to be 80s teen horror, um, there's a lot of joy that I gain from that sort of thing because it's it's really pulling at the threads of what is setting and what is mechanic. Like, how much, how much of this is actually mechanical rule and how much of it is just the words we're wrapping it in, mm. you know? Like, that was a big point of my 80s teen slasher video that I did to be incendiary um where you know i was saying i didn't change any rules i just renamed everything and suddenly the flavor of it is different um because the words you choose matter um and actually when you go through with a really fine tooth comb uh separating genre from mechanic from setting you can you can get a lot of different combinations i I think i think that's fun (laughs) i think where the rubber meets the road on this is players Mm mm-hmm because you can say, I'm going to use 5e, but I'm going to jettison this part and change this part, which is fine until your players say, but I want my rogue to be able to do this. And you say, well, in the, my world, and then you've just lost everyone. <laughs> yeah. Equal uh, for every time I've had that. <laughs> it, it, precisely. And, and so can you? Yes. How acceptable will it be with your group or with the... 10,000 people that play your game or with the 100,000 people that play your adventure or with the million people that play D&D regularly? How does it play with them? And to be fair, just quickly, I have been that DM a lot of times where players are like, well, I do this. And I'm like, well, in this world. And then coincidentally, playing Vampire Masquerade, have learned how bad that feels as a player sometimes when I'm like, I'm a vampire. Like, can't I just like go and rip this dude's head off and 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 drink the blood out of his stump? And he's like, "Well, you could, but in this world, that's really frowned upon for like these reasons." So your character would know not to do that. Pardon me. And so there is 
you know, maybe expectations built in a session zero or whatever, but in a session zero, it's impossible to get every, especially in a system as broad as 5e, with, especially in the spell section, uh, with how many spells there are, it's impossible to catch every little circumstance where you as the GM might want to change how something works or exclude something or add something. Um, so there is a balancing act between how the GM sees the world, but ensuring that the players are still able to invent within that and bring things into that world. Yeah, and I feel like, especially towards what you said originally about, like, oh, we can't have a murder mystery, that that kind of idea, idea of, like, people prescribing things to the system just because something exists. Like, in our modern daily society, we have stop signs. <laughs> a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, you know, whatever, uh, no one's going to look back on history and be like, let's say a thousand. Um years from now no one's gonna look back and be like because there were stop signs everyone stopped at the stop signs and no one rolled through them when that's markedly wrong so just because there's an existence of such spells doesn't mean that it automatically cancels out like what you can and can't do the same way like a murder mystery has some uh things in it that i would say are necessary like you need the twist you need the you need you need a mystery uh to build off of but it's not a rule set um so i don't think 5e is like batting down and saying like no you can't do that stuff um i think those people are just reading it for like very prescriptively and being like oh this spell mm. exists so because it like it's not going to work 100 percent of the time Players will ask the wrong questions. Like everything that mm. can go wrong oh, will yeah. go wrong. So, mm-hmm. oh man, one of my favorite things Sean Moen has ever said on this podcast was when he was like, let me introduce you to this incredible invention, a mask. <laughs> 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 you can speak with dead all you like, but they didn't see who the killer was. <laughs> they came from behind. Like, um, I also love doing things like, oh, the cops got there first. And the first thing they did was cast speak with dead. So by the time you get there, you got to wait a week before yep. you can do it again because that's how the spell works. Or, um, I don't know, I, I pulled some shit with my players one time when they were doing Speak With Dead, but I had specifically set a timer for when um, someone was going to arrive and, like, break up the party and they had to flee. And the alarm went off just as they asked the most dramatic final question of their set. And my players were so upset with me because I <laughs> would not budge and give them the answer. I was like... The timer went off. It went off. I, this oh. is too dramatic. We have to do it. Jeez. And and the, the amazing thing is we're talking about ways to get around these spells. It would be so easy for the 2024 edition of Dungeons and Dragons to get rid of those spells for us. To get rid of Goodberry so you could run a survival campaign. Get rid of these things that are there, but they're not needed. They're not, put Speak With Dead only on scrolls. And you, DM, can then give them out when you need them. Right? It would be so easy for the developers and the designers to do that. But again, we have these pesky players out there and these pesky oh. players who have been playing since I started who say, well, well this is not D&D if you don't have Speak With Dead. Uh, it was in it the is. movie, Sean. I it has know. to be there. <laughs> I know. Put it on well, a scroll. I, yeah. And, and when I brought this up, talked about, you know, a lot of YouTube channels, and we've talked about this before, uh, particularly recently, want to create sensationalist sounding um, uh, kind of thumbnails and headlines and make sensationalist or, or not even sensationalist, but just definitive arguments saying like D&D cannot be this because X thing exists, which often leads to the argument that because it's in the rules, it must exist somewhere. And the rules are, is, is the world, which I, you know, I disagree with. I think that, you know, a GM is within their rights, uh, at least in some capacity in dialogue with the players to say like, okay, these things aren't going to be part of this world or this game. There's no Warforged in this world for X reason. You know, we don't have Dragonborn for X reason. And often, unfortunately, worlds become defined by what's not in them as opposed to what is in them. Um, disappointingly, I, I find, um, because that's what players can can sometimes get focused on. Um but then I look at something like Daggerheart and the way that they've got the card system and the heritages that they've introduced in Daggerheart, which are very high fantasy, cat people, angels, um, uh, uh, you know, turtle people, frogmen, all these different very high fantasy kind of anthropomorphic concepts 
that feel like they're much more at the center of the the setting or, or the the system because they are the the heritages that you can choose from from the large part. If you're if you're trying to pass it down to get rid of those anthropomorphized heritages, you're narrowing it down to a very narrow select number of heritages in Daggerheart specifically, as opposed to fifth edition, which still has you know elf, human, halfling, gnome, um, orc, arguably. Um, you know, so so it become you know Daggerheart feels like its rules system is much more built into their setting than fifth edition necessarily automatically is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm I'm preparing myself mentally to have to learn a, a lot of law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm hyping myself up to read that chapter <laughs> and throw things. It will be a chapter. <laughs> it's like it's gotta oh, be. Yeah. <laughs> minimum um i i think there's also you know this is something that um look not to suggest that there should be something before session zero but um i think there is something there is something before session zero which is the part where you're sending out little little messages of feelers to all your friends who play D and you're trying to figure out who's going to be excited about something mm-hmm. and sure. it's a little bit tricky because i think everyone's instinct when someone says hey i've got an idea for a D campaign the the instinct is to be like yes i want to play D." but i wish my ideal reality is the one where we get to a point where you can send a feeler out to like 10 people and be like this is the campaign are you excited about the idea of a world where magic is dead like are you excited about that because i want to play this and like if you're not that's great you'll be in the next one like you're still going to be invited but i'm i'm hunting for my four players who are as excited about no war forge no magic blah 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 whatever yeah, sure uh, as I am right now. Um, but is, then again, I suppose that is partially due to my um, love for short campaigns as well. <laughs> that is amazing. You've just created session negative one. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's great. Session and I, divided I, by zero. I would only add, don't tell them that you're going to run a campaign there. Just say, I was thinking about uh, what's your opinion on Deception. worlds without magic. <laughs> yeah. and uh, Oh, you hate it? Well, you're out of my next campaign then. Bye. <laughs> click. <laughs> <laughs> That'll show them. I, I have very honest players. They let me know when I when they're not excited about an idea. When I'm like, oh, I'd kind of like to try this. They're like, no. Okay, all right. Well, I guess just keep doing what we're doing then. That's fine. Too. I love that. I feel like that's like always been my philosophy, but I approach it with such a feeling of nervousness, like. I've always been like, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to like it. Um, this is what I'm thinking, whatever. And then my players go, if it's you, I'm playing. And then I'm like, but that <laughs> doesn't tell me if you're going to enjoy it. Like that's, I don't, and I, I feel like I'm also, I'm just like, you don't have to do this one. If you aren't excited about Lego D and D, like it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm excited about it. This is you clicking and saying you're excited with me. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. There is that problem as well. It's the, the to go back to theatre when you came off stage when you were in high school or like early college years, and your mum came and saw the play, and you were like, "Did you like it?" And mm-hmm. she was like, "Yeah, you were great." Okay, what 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 did you like about it? Oh, you know, you were in it. Okay, great. I you, never you know. <laughs> had this exact problem. My mum would always, I could tell how she felt. She would never lie or or anything like that, but. She w- she would compliment other people <laughs> <laughs> on their performances. And it was never deliberate. It was never like her her like dodging the question. It was just that she was really focused on that boy did very well, and right. I could tell that I didn't do as well as I would have liked <laughs> because I didn't capture her attention more than my friend Toma. Ah, <laughs> um, Well, speaking of capturing folks' attention. Let's let's go into this last question. I don't think it'll. Uh, hopefully, it won't it'd be super long answers. We can we are do running it. Out of we time. Can. Let's we see have. here. Micah yeah. sent an email. Where did Micah send the email to, Dale? Me again. He sent yeah. it to podcast at ghostfiregaming dot com. Ghost ghostfire Fish gaming. <laughs> no, you got it right. Just uh, <laughs> don't add me time? again to the start of that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Micah asking. <laughs> Players have recently unlocked te- the teleport spell in their 5e game, meaning that they can literally go anywhere in the campaign world. But as a GM, uh, Mike is feeling a little bit nervous because they can't be expected to prep 
everywhere in the campaign world uh, that the players might want to teleport to. So as you're starting to crest into that higher level play, uh, how do you deal with specifically teleport is Micah's question, but there are other spells that are kind of not dissimilar to it, like scrying that require a GM to think, what is this character on the other side of the world doing at this exact moment? We have to remember that D&D, the, the player's handbook, and I think the Dungeon Master's Guide tell us that there are four tiers of play, and each tier should feel different. Unfortunately, it doesn't do a good job as a game of making that a reality with the rules. But I think for tier one, it does an okay job. T- levels one to four, you feel like you're trying to survive. You're trying to get by. And then we hit that second tier where at fifth level, we get fireball. And at fifth level, the uh, rogue gets uncanny dodge, I think. And and uh, fighters and, and martial classes get the extra attack. Okay, good. We've moved into another tier of play. And then... We have to start writing adventures differently. We have to start planning our campaigns differently because of that. When they get the fly spell, you have to take uh, that into account when you create encounters. We have to start doing that when teleport gets there. Teleport's a seventh level spell, I think. Okay. So so at, at that point, you have to take into account that when you create your adventures. If you're worried about a teleport, ruining the adventure have the adventure be they need to use teleport right away to get to the place where the adventure is happening there they've used teleport you don't have to worry about it now Uh, that's how you have to start designing your adventures if you are worried about them going anywhere and ruining your adventure Uh, to create your content differently other people will have better advice than i just gave but that's the thing you're playing a different adventure. Uh, you're playing a different game when you get to the point that characters can start casting that. So create your adventure to uh, accommodate that sort of play. Yeah, I mean, I I think that there's something to, I think this is said all the time, needing to take a break sounds like such a cop out. Like we've broken the feel of the table. We've broken the minute, the second that we're in. Um, So the DM can prep something, the immersion of the moment of like everyone casting or one person casting teleport or teleport. I mean, that's a very valid way to do things, though. I think it's very valid to be like, we're going to take a 10 and I'm going to think because sometimes what you need is maybe like, especially you might not need to prep an extra 30 minutes to think of everyone. You might just need 60 extra seconds to just sit at your table and think about, okay, well, in my mind, I know what's happening in the world. What can I possibly put into this moment um, to make it matter? I think that there's also, like, depending on the world that you're in, I think that the second that my players, my players right now are level six, um, but once they get access to, you know, higher level spells like that, depending on the setting, my setting is like very low magic, homebrewed. So you have to focus. I think I would probably say something like, you have to focus for. Uh, it's almost like an attunement to the spell in order to cast it. That way it gives you a little bit more time to actually prepare where they're going. Maybe their characters have to spend like a day or something with their intentions set on that place um, or even like charging it up uh, to where they have to spend a full in-game day. To And that gives you a little bit more time to actually think ahead, plan, write things down, um, type things into your laptop, search up a couple of things. But I feel like the second you get to these higher level spells, um, if they're not something like meteor shower or like anything that just automatically has a damaging effect or like it, person's intelligence goes to zero, whatever, then you really have to give yourself as much buffer as you possibly can. Because to be honest, I don't always make the best decision in the moment, like split second after someone says something. So giving yourself an extra 60 seconds or even in game 30 minutes um, where your players are just like, okay, well we have to do our downtime stuff can be a little bit of a breather for you um, to approach it a little bit more logically and in the pocket of how you would, in a way that won't make you feel bad if you look back on it and be like, I should have done this better. So Yes, I think that the answer is simple. Just tell your players, simply tell your players, 
that the teleportation spell is banned in your setting. Uh, <laughs> they cannot cast it. It doesn't time. exist. <laughs> Along with Speak with Dead. Um, no, I think that's that's really great advice because you, there's because teleportation isn't an instant cast, right? It's it's like minimum ten minutes mm-hmm. or something like that to to cast it. So. Make them there's, really cast it. There's this, yeah. I mean, if they're in the pressure of like combat or whatever, it's not going to happen to you. Um, but if they try to do it in downtime, then you have the beautiful power of downtime. Like Lexi says, to, to ask all your other players, all right, what are you doing with your day? <laughs> and then suddenly you've got a whole shopping trip. You've got that. And then, oh, the next thing you know, by the time they're ready to teleport, it's the end of the session and you've got time to prep for next week, um, which is <laughs> which is great. Uh, I am also a big proponent of um, taking a step back. And I, I love um, if a session ends unexpectedly early, like if something big happens that you have to suddenly prep for, I love being able to, to end it on that dramatic beat and then just say, we're going to play a board game for the rest of the, the night or whatever. You know, I, I love being able to do that. Um, I also, you know, I check in a lot of chaotic homebrew that causes things like that. But um, even being able to just say something really dramatic, like you, the, the teleportation takes hold, you feel your molecules split apart and be, you know, rammed back together at the speed of, of light. And then you open your eyes to darkness. Bah, 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 bah. All right, that's where we're going to end the session for today. You know what I mean? And and that gives nothing away. It's a very simple thing that you can you can start with next time. Um, but the other thing I would say is it sounds more intimidating than it is. Mm-hmm. You, you actually will find over time that you can trust yourself more and more with just coming up with stuff on the fly because there is nothing wrong as well with just being like uh, you appear in the middle of a town square and then they can spend a while like getting their bearings and it you know you don't have to immediately leap into having a game plan with plot points and hooks ready um you you can kind of let them explore for a while and trust yourself to come up with interesting characters on the fly uh, you know a, a simple village on the fly it's it's you you are more capable of doing that than you think you are well you can also trust your players more than you think as well in terms of uh, you know, as you say, Dale, incentivize. Um, I find, and maybe I'm just lucky with the group that I have, but they're pretty predictable to me because I know that I can lay down a couple of plot hooks. And generally speaking, I'll have a pretty good idea of what they're going to be interested in and where they're going to go. So if they had access to a spell like teleport, I think, yes, it sounds intimidating because it's like the whole world is open to them, but the players don't know what they haven't been told. They don't know something exists if they haven't been told that it exists. Um, And so you can generally guess why they might want to teleport to a a specific location and then just plan an encounter, probably a combat encounter because they can absorb lots of real-world time that fits the one or two locations you think they might want to teleport and just have those in your back pocket ready to, you know, even if they teleport exactly where they want to go, that room happens to be filled with automatons this time and they all activate and come to life the moment you drop into the room. Ooh, hell uh, yeah. Everybody roll for an o- initiative. Oh, initiative. Uh, initiative. Um, initiative is when you don't get a turn. <laughs> bad. Had players experience that. <laughs> the, the, the last thing I would say is don't... If you're worried about spells like that breaking the adventure, let that let it let it happen. If they come up with a great plan that is just you cast a spell, we can't speak with dad, we find the answer, great. Let it happen. Uh give them a big pat on the back. Hey, you're a great, great group. And then take five minutes That's to plan so what happens. Real. Next. Yeah. That's so real. Sean is right. Yeah. We're also fixated on making a coherent story that's immersive that, that we don't break away from. But Sean is so right. When your players break your game, they are filled with joy. There is no greater <laughs> thrill to your players than when they ruin the things you had planned. <laughs> Just let that be a fun thing. <laughs> Just smile. There. You, you can definitely see in some of the pre-written adventures where the adventure designers were like, oh, um... They'll probably have access to this spell, so uh, it just doesn't work here. This room cannot be teleported into for any reason. Uh, Or they cannot teleport out of this room for any... Or they can't move within the dungeon via, like, special spell. And it's just accepted. That's the way it is. And then as the GM, you can be like, don't blame me. That's just what it's... uh, That's the the physics of this space. It's written into the adventure. It's in crayon, but it's there. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of adventures, that is the end of this week's adventure as we come to the end of the episode of the Eldritch Lawcast that is numbered 132, I think. Um, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you can give us a thumbs up. You can give us stars. You can do all that stuff. It helps us out, get out to more listeners. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Um, I hope you can all still see. Don't stare directly at an eclipse. Um, uh, 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 good good things are, are in your future, I'm sure. <laughs> Lexi, if folks want to find you, where is it that they can uh, find what you're up to? Uh, I'm in the sun, so you do have to look at the eclipse to find me. Um, <laughs> okay, <fair enough. laughs> no, you can find me um, on Twitter and Twitch uh, and YouTube um, at Black Girl Mage. That's where I am. That's where I stay. That's where you stay. Dale, do you also live in the sun? I do also live in the sun. How crazy is that? Yeah. Wild, small world. Very small. Um, <laughs> yeah. Are you asking me where I'm on the internet? What's yeah, happening? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sh- okay. <laughs> 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 I'm also on the internet. <laughs> you can find me on YouTube and on Twitter and all sorts of places. You can Google Dale Kingswell. It's, I'll come up. I'm there. I'm fine. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Are you uh, on the internet, Ben? I, I, I am on do the internet. Do you live in the sun? No, I live on the moon. Um, (laughs) the light side of the moon though so i was getting a good tan uh for for a few moments there or would would that be the dark side of the moon i don't know the moon has many sides it's a complex moon you know shades of gray the morally ambiguous moon uh at the ben burn is where you can find me sean merwin where can folks find you and what else you're up to i'm not on the internet i don't believe in such things Fair enough. Uh, all right. Well, no, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, at Sean Merwin everywhere, uh, Mastering Dungeons and sometimes here in my right mind. Uh, yeah, go check out Mastering Dungeons. It's a, also a great podcast. My name's been Ben Byrne here with Sean Merwin, Dale Kingsmill, Lexi McQueen. We will be back next week with another episode of this podcast, the Eldritch Podcast. Email this to your grandpa. Did you say the Eldritch Just, Podcast? He, maybe Eldritch <laughs> Lawcast, this one. <laughs> This is this is the this is the podcast you. We're very professional, yeah. <laughs> I think it's about it, about it, about it, the time. Oh yeah, but about it, about Yeah, <laughs> it's about time for them, but it is. We're out. We're done. <laughs> cut it. Cut it. Over. Cut the camera. Cut the feed. <laughs> um, take get us out of here. Get us out. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Eldritch Podcast. Send that to your grandpa. (laughs) (laughs) 